get started. Our dear kind Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much that we can come to you across the world like And then we can get into the Bible, get into your word, get into the spirit of prophecy and, and share wisdom that we have also learned in councils for courtship and marriage. Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit be with each one of us as we are listening today. Please give us your wisdom and understanding as you promised that you give us in James 1, 5 and 6. You want me to speak even if it's different from what the words are on my page the lord may this be be a blessing to everyone here and may this all be done and glory and to glorify you and so that we can live in accordance to your word and be ready for when you come i pray this in Jesus' holy name amen, amen. all right so you know, there's a lot of wonderful verses about um, relationships in the Bible. I have a series here. Uh, and just also just in general, Proverbs uh, 3, 5, 5, um, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. That is so important. Lots of times as we are growing, we are thinking that we understand how everything works and how things should be. And later, as we get older and wiser, a little lot more wiser, we're always learning. We realize that maybe our, our thoughts when we were young weren't quite as mature as we thought they were. Genesis 2.24 says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. In the marriage union, you're a brand new, brand new family, even though it just starts out with the two of you, but you are your own family unit at that point. And therefore it does make sense. A man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife. And there is a sacred boundary around that marriage unit that has been that is established at the wedding. It says here, there's lots of advice about um, other aspects rela relating to relationships. Um, 1 Corinthians 7, 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. And let every woman have her own husband. 1 Corinthians 6.18. Flee fornication. Um, every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. Let's see. What else does it say? Matthew 5.27. Ye, ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. Thou shalt not commit adultery. There's so many things here. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. And one of the things I think is the hardest when you're a young person and you're thinking about courtship and your marriage, you're all excited, you know, you're, you know, I'm tired of living with mom and dad. I want to have my own place, my own wife, my own husband. If you're thinking that, you're not ready yet. That's a sign of immature thinking. Because if you actually do that, your, your relationship and your marriage and your home is going to be very unstable. So we want to impress upon people don't rush into hasty early marriages. Mrs. White wrote about this extensively. Those who don't have access to it, uh, a number of files from the Spirit of Prophecy that um, would be very good to review and to um, 
have available, maybe used for group discussions. Uh, they include things like unwise marriage, where it's mentioned in spirit prophecy, unequally yoked, uh, courtship. There are hundreds of references in there that I can't possibly go over each one of them in the time that we have allotted today. But uh, there's so there's in addition to what I'm sharing with you today, there's hours and hours more worth of material that is available to you to study on your own or in your own groups here. So first thing we want to think about today, we're looking at our picture here, hopefully. Hopefully that's showing up. Preparing for marriage. Spirit of Prophecy counsels behavior and courtship, compatibility. And as I, as I woke up this morning and sat down and prayed about this meeting, uh, I had a number of pages that of more notes to share with you. So anyway, so we'll get started here. First of all, seek God always. Seek him first. Before you're married, after you're married, always. Seeking divine guidance. The family tie is the closest, most tender and sacred of any on earth. It was designed to be a blessing to mankind, and it is a blessing wherever the marriage covenant is entered into intelligently and, and maturely in the fear of God and with due consideration for its responsibilities. So when we go into a marriage situation, it is not just a um, cakewalk. Well, now we can do whatever we want. I can sleep in as long as I want and get up when I want. No, when you go into marriage, uh, it's time to work. <laughs> There's a lot of work there. And so that's, that's something that I think young people need to understand. And we'll talk, we'll talk more about that in a few minutes here. So let me just move on to my next slide here. Um, here. One second. Okay, so I'm going to show you a picture here. Have you ever seen a mustard seed or a mustard tree? Look at this, these two pictures here. Here we have on the left hand side, we have mustard seeds of different types of mustard trees. Think about this as you go into a marriage. Inside each one of these little seeds potentially can become a tree of this size. Jesus talks about how about the mustard seed in the Bible. And it's so, so tiny. <clears throat> but as you when you get married, you're basically the two of you are coming together. And while you are separate physical beings, you come together as one. And so, but, but after you say I do, you don't immediately become this tree. And I'm gonna to try to do it this way here. Okay. What happens is when you're married, when you first get married, you're like a tender little plant that is very delicate, new, has lots of energy and strength in it, um, potentially because those little seeds can grow up into be into that tree. And as your as your uh, relationship grows in your marriage, you become a new tree. The two of you have become one and it starts to grow, starts to flourish. Children come kind of like this. But again, even in the few, first few years, you're not like this mature tree. This is after years and years of marriage. So I just want you to kind of have that image in your mind of when you think about courtship and marriage, you start out very small. But the potential, you know, the potential in every one of those mustard seeds is to become a huge, huge tree that gives great shade for all and gives, you know, place for birds and, and shade for animals and so forth. And that is what potentially your, the marriage relationship should be for those around you. And so as we're talking, I wanted to, before we get into, um, hold on one second. Let me just switch my page here. I wanted 
I want to share with you something from the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald. This is from January 26, 1886. And uh, this file you have that I've uploaded for you so that you can have this. We're not going to cover the whole thing today, but I do want to touch on a few points. This, the title of this particular article is Courtship and Marriage. And you can also download it from the uh, documents.adventistarchives.org website as well. You go into periodicals and then you pick Review and Herald and then you put the year in 1886 and then you find January 26 and just download the PDF. So if you have internet access, you can access it there. But there's something here that she does give us a lot of warnings in this particular article. I'll just read a few points here. Trials and tip. Many are sailing, but they scorn to feeling that they are competent to guide their own bark and not realizing that it is about to strike a hidden rock that may cause them to make shipwreck of faith and happiness. They are infatuated with the subject of courtship and marriage, and their principal burden is to have their own way. In this, the most important period of their lives, yes, when you're young, when you're in your teens, early 20s, they need an unerring counselor and an infallible guide. This they will find in the word of God, and unless they are diligent students of that word, they will make grave mistakes with which will mar their happiness and that of others, both for the present and the future life. You know, even a few moments of indiscretion can lead to, just one second, I need to drink something. My throat is a little bit scratchy here. Even a few moments of indiscretion, a pregnancy can result. And that'll change <clears throat> life for the, the entire life of everybody involved. And, um, you know, it just, it does. It changes everyone's lives. It says, there is a disposition with which many to be impetuous and headstrong. They have not heeded the wise counsel of the word of God. They have not battled with self. Battling with self is something that you will find you will do your entire lives, even before you're married, after you're married. And as we go through the sanctification process, you know, Jesus promises us that he who overcomes, I will. And read the, seven, the, the uh, counsel to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. He tells the reward that he will give you if you overcome. And the battling with self is the biggest thing we have to overcome. But that comes through asking him to come into our lives and change our hearts so that we are reflecting his image. He has to take out our carnal heart and, and uh, put his heart in us. And that's, a, that's sanctification. That's a work of a lifetime. The Bible presents a perfect standard of character. I cannot stress how important character is. It should be something that should be taught to people from the time they are in, you know, uh, Sabbath school, young kindergarten, um, all the way up through until the time we die. Our character has so much impact on our lives, on everybody else's lives, and our characters have to be refined back, purified, made holy if we expect to go to heaven. And in, in, a, in a sanctified character or in the process of that will make your relationships go so much more smoothly and bring a lot of peace to your heart too. The, the Bible presents a perfect standard of character. The sacred book inspired by God and written by holy men is a perfect guide under all circumstances of life. It sets forth distinctly the duties of both the young and the old. 
If made the guide of life, its teachings will lead the soul upward. It will elevate the mind, improve the character, and give peace and joy to the heart. Amen. But many of the young have chosen to be their own counselor and guide and have taken their causes in their own hands. Such need to study more closely the teachings of the Bible. In its pages, they will find revealed their duty to their parents and to their brethren in the faith. The fifth commandment reads, honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And again, we read, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. One of the signs that we are living in the last days is that children are disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. The word of God abounds in precepts and counsels, enjoining respect for parents. It impresses upon the young the sacred duty of loving and cherishing those who have guided them through infancy, childhood, youth, up to manhood and womanhood, and who are now in a great degree dependent upon them for peace and happiness. The Bible gives no uncertain sound on this subject. Nevertheless, teachings have been greatly disregarded. So I pray that as we are thinking about these things in court, uh, courtship and marriage, it's the, that union is not just for ourselves and our partner, but it's for our extended, our families, our parents. We're not to neglect them when they are old and can't help themselves. So I want to go on here and share some practical um, information about marriage preparation. I have some lists here uh that came to me early this morning and i have some suggestions for both ladies and the men and uh, then we'll get into the councils on marriage and behavior in uh, councils on courtship and also the behavior as well does somebody have a question maybe they're talking to somebody else okay so i'm going to go back here and just have a different picture for you. Um, in fact, I'll just do it this way. Close that. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, one of the, the best gift that we can give our spouse on our wedding day is to present them ourselves prepared as far as possible, ready to go to work marriage you're in marriage you're going to go to work going to work to build a home together to support each other we'll talk about each of these to support each other to establish that marriage and family on a solid christian foundation and doing that by your own personal relationship with christ you want to find somebody when you get married you want to find somebody who is at least as least as strong as you in the faith or preferably even stronger. But they need to have that active. And that doesn't mean just going to church each Sabbath. That means they have an active, growing relationship with Christ. They are reading their Bibles. They're praying. They are reading other, you know, spirit of prophecy books, gaining knowledge of, you know, and wisdom that's been given to us. Also, being prepared being prepared to help your spouse in whatever way you can. We'll talk about that in a bit. We should be level-headed once we go into marriage and also courtship. We have to be realistic, be level-headed, be mature, be unselfish, be kind, not demanding, and be realistic of what you both can and cannot do at every step of marriage. When you first get married, you know, you probably won't have a lot of belongings. The, the husband who usually is the breadwinner of the family, you know, his job that he has when he, when he gets married probably won't be the same as later on down, you know, decades down the road. And so you might, you'll be beginning with humble beginnings. And the other thing is to be aware of is to be aware of the dangers 
that seek to damage or ruin a relationship or marriage. Those dangers, Satan has dangers around every corner. So we looked at the we looked at the mustard seeds and the mustard tree. And as and one of the most valuable uh, resources you have when you're young and you get married is you have your energy, your youth, and your strength. And don't ever discount that, treasure that, because over time, over the decades, they diminish. We think when we're young, I will have this energy forever. No, not, not so. <laughs> it goes, it, it, it gradually decreases. So as much as, as much as we prepare ourselves before marriage, we want to prepare ourselves spiritually, education, if we're trying to get an education that needs to be done before we get married, um, learning how to cook. This applies to both men and women. Learn how to cook. It's not just one person's job. Learning how to manage a home. What does that mean? Managing finances. Now, managing finances also means living within your means. If you have $100 coming in once a week, and that's all you have to work with, that's it. Debt is not your friend. Debt is your enemy. So live within your means. Learning how to manage a home inclu includes how to cook, how to clean, how to do laundry, not putting in the reds with the whites and ending up with pinks. Men don't like to go to church with a pink shirt. Um, so we have to pay attention to little details like that. Very important. Uh, we need to, before marriage, we need to be realistic on bills that come in. When we're no longer living under our parents' roof, you know, our parents took care of the bills for electricity, water, trash, sewer, whatever is in your, you know, in your situation there. When you're now a married couple, that's all your responsibility. And so you have to really stop and think and, you know, talk to your parents, talk to other people. What does it cost to have, like, what do you pay for electricity every month? What do you pay for rent every month? What do you pay for um, water if you pay for water every month? What do you pay for other utilities that you need every month? Gas. And write those things down. And these are serious things to consider during courtship. You know, if you're going to get married and he's going to be the breadwinner and she's going to stay home, does his job, will it pay for all of those things plus food, plus other things that you need? You got to have a roof and a roof over your head. And so this is where this is where it's really getting down to the um, basics of what life is like after you're married. Um, we got to have to be realistic about acquiring needs, your basic, you know, your furniture, you know, a bed, table and chairs, couch, refrigerator, clothes, washer, you know, you start writing all these things down and what they cost and you go, oh my goodness, how do people ever do this? Well, they do, but they do it usually in small increments. And so having a realistic expectation going into marriage and what is going to need to build a home and what alternatives you can do if you don't have a clothes washer where you wash your clothes if you don't have if you don't have table and chairs what do you do you know we need to th think about those and and uh, be realistic it's the one thing to, i think it's most important is to realize that when you go into a marriage relationship you're not going to walk into the home that your parents have been establishing for decades or your grandmother's had for decades your immediate resources are going to be limited and that's okay there we go and that's okay because it's exciting to go out and make those first purchases it's kind of fun to only eat off a if you if all you have when you first get married is you know some boxes for a table and you have a piece of wood over it and a tablecloth you know what that's really kind of neat there's, there's nothing wrong with that. And then when you finally are able to go out and buy a table and chairs, that's exciting too. Every one of these little experiences is, is special. It's very special. I remember the first time I got table and chairs. I was like, wow, I felt like I was the richest person on earth. Um, so let's, let's go on. 
the other thing to be as prepare yourself, it's important to prepare yourself before marriage is self-discipline. I used to think about this often when I first got married and I thought I recognized my weaknesses and not being as disciplined as I wanted to be and needed to be. And I could see the effects of that. And so being disciplined, um, you know, managing your time, sticking to a schedule, you know, when you're living with mom and dad, they're telling you, go do this, go do that. Don't forget this. Remember this. Oh yeah. Before you go home, before you come home, stop and do this. Well, when you're married, they're not telling you that anymore. And, and if they are, that can be a problem because now when you're married, you are your own home unit and it's dangerous to have too much interference by other people. And so you have to learn to be disciplined. Yes, it is your own home when you're married. You can do what you want, but you can stay up late. You can get up late. But here's what happens. You will have a huge price to play if you're not disciplined, both man and woman. The bills still come. The rent still needs to be paid. Food still needs to be purchased. Utility bills need to be paid. A vehicle, if you have a vehicle, that still needs to be paid for if you're making payments or maintained, always maintained. Gas in the car, there's, there's so much here. So if you are not disciplined, before marriage, you're gonna have a difficult time in marriage and your home will suffer. If you, you know, you're all, if you're not disciplined and doing, um, you know, laundry on a regular basis, you know, sometimes I've heard of stories where people do laundry and they just throw the clothes in a pile and they never ever fold them up. And when they look for clothes, they gotta go fish them out and iron them. That's not, that's not good. That's not, a, the Lord talks, um, we're told in the spirit of prophecy, the Lord likes uh, his children to have orderly organized homes. And that's another thing. While you may start out with very few things when you first get married, over time, things do accumulate. And to the point where you can have too much stuff that is becomes clutter and that is that is very uh draining on you and and that needs to be managed as well sometimes we just have to go through and do spring cleaning and clean out what we don't need and uh because the same is true less is more when you have nice cleared off countertops it's very easy on the eyes when you have nice cleared off, you know, when things have, a, everything should have its own place. And I'm speaking ideally because it's easy to get off balance. And when you see yourself getting off balance, it's time to stop and just go through and clean out. And I'm talking about myself as well, because this happens. So here's some advice. I'm just going to talk to you like I'm your older brother, uh, older sister. I'm not an older brother, but older sister. And just kind of giving advice to the, to the young ones, especially go to bed early and get up early, easier said than done, but it is, it is a good idea. Be like the birds because you want to get up early. You want to have that devotional time. And especially in those early morning hours, it's very, very precious when you can be up and having that communion, communion time with the Lord personally. You might have a worship with your with your spouse as well, but you need to have that and, and make time for God daily. Don't squeeze him out. Don't squeeze him out. It won't go, go well for you. And think about this. When I say go to bed early, every hour that you sleep before midnight is like having two hours of sleep after midnight. So go to bed early and get up early. You know what, whatever, how it works out best for you. Also, be realistic about what you can afford. Think about this during courtship. Talk about this during courtship. Think about this during marriage. One person may be better at managing money than the other. One person may just have natural, um, I'm really good at math, and so I'm going to handle all the money. Well, 
but both of you doesn't regard regardless of who actually sits down and writes out the bills both of you need to see and plan and decide how money coming into the home is being spent if the if the husband makes a is a makes a lot of money and says don't worry i'll take care of it i make enough money don't worry everything's done no not good that may be true but the woman needs to see heaven forbid, passes away. And she has no uh, familiarity with how to, you know, what things cost, what all these different bills cost, and what she will need to do to continue the life with her and children if they are there. She needs to know as well. Um, men, here's just, here's, I just jotted down a few ideas here that were just very important that I've, I've gone through an experience or I know of other people who've had experiences here. Men, don't keep this from your wives. They need to know the money going in and going out. And let me see what I say here. Okay. Um, both of you, whether you're making a lot of money or you're making a little money, consult with each other before spending money. Don't just think, well, we got money in the bank. I can go. That's not wise consult with each other because you don't know what needs the other one has identified that may have and you may not have discussed it with each other yet ladies the if you go out and spend money on something that you feel you really need and maybe you really do need it uh stop talk to your husband first because that money that you may be spending and you could say well we really need this that may be the same money that he was planning to use to pay the utility bill for that month or needed it for, for rent money. So we need to be very, we need to have marriage. Uh, the biggest problem in marriages is finances. And the biggest problem beyond that is communication about the finances. So you need to talk about everything and, not, and uh, be well aware of what, what's going on. Also, for the men, ladies do need money for personal hygiene, hygiene items monthly. Don't deprive them of that. Don't, don't come home and, you know, just go to, the, go to the computer and say, I know one couple this happened to, they were first married and she was working, he was working. And every day the husband would come home, jump on the computer. And as he did it, he would say, well, I got to see how much money you went and spent yesterday. And she was making a good income. And that was a very, that was a very damaging thing to that relationship. Is what I was told. Um, Cause she thought, how can it be that I, you know, earn a good living because I've gotten an education and yet I can't even go out and buy nylons or shampoo. That's, in, that's imbalance there. So men, if you haven't lived with uh, older sisters before or whatever, and now it's your first time with a, you're living with your wife, keep that in mind. She needs money to purchase basic hygiene things every single month, things that you may never have concert, concert, uh, considered before. So communicate, communicate, and listen to each other. So important. Um, ladies, we don't need the biggest and brightest things. We don't need to purchase things based on name tag. And I'm not saying that anybody here listening is, but it's just one of those principles. We don't have to have, I don't know, Calvin Klein, is that still around? Is that a big name? Versace. We don't need those types of things. And especially as Christians, the Lord holds us accountable for how we use our resources. So, you know, make do with what you can do with what you can get uh, that's within your means. And even if you can afford expensive things, uh, again, if you're, you have if you have a Christian home, the Lord holds you accountable for how you are spending those resources. I mean, if you have, if you can afford a thousand dollar purse, mm, you probably don't need it. And that won't look good on your record in heaven. 
because the Lord gives us the talents and gifts that we have to earn resources. He expects us to use those talents and gifts, not just for our own um, gain and advancement, but he expects us to use those in a way that will continue to glory, to lead people to his kingdom. That's what those gifts and talents are for. Yes, we need them to sustain ourselves, but not to indulge ourselves. Um, tithe. Don't forget tithe. That's the first thing we're supposed to set aside in our income is tithe for the Lord. Um, both men and women never, ever hide expenditures from one another from one another. Don't go and make per, make, make per, large purchases. I mean, men, if you're if you give your if your you know your wife's you have budgeted for your wife so much for personal things, that's for her personal things, her personal you know hygiene items and so forth. But for you know you know buying a television or or I wouldn't even suggest that, but you know buying a printer or a computer or whatever, don't purchase things without talking to the other person because that's only going to cause friction when they find out, especially if, if you're, if the means are tight, you're, you've gone from two peep individuals to now you are one unit. You are a, like that tree that's growing together. And if you're doing things that are, is going to tear you apart, you're tearing apart that tree. You don't want to do that. Save, save money every month. Emergencies do come up build up a main and maintain some kind of a reserve that is always there and don't touch it unless you absolutely have to you know you might you know i they used to tell us when i was younger they'd say main you know have build up a thousand dollars in reserve and just leave it there because things happen you know you, you're taught yeah you know you're stranded and you know you need money for a new tire and you don't have money for a new tire budgeted, but you can get it from your emergency fund and then try to replenish it when you can. So always save as, as much as possible. Just because there's money in that account doesn't mean it needs to be spent. You might have a friend who might have a need, an urgent need to where your, your financial resources can be a blessing to them. Um, when starting out in a marriage, in your family home, it's okay to make do with what you can afford. You may only start out with a bed to sleep in. And again, you may only have boxes for your clothes. You may not even be able to have a, um, you may not have a bureau. Uh, you may have boxes for tabletops. You may be sitting on the floor eating. That's good. There's nothing wrong with that. And it also shows you that you can survive in living, you know, more simply, more prim primitively, I should say, but it's okay. And when you get those things to replace them, that's, that's exciting. That's a lot of fun. Um, if you're in areas that have thrift shops, go to thrift shops. You know, I'll tell you when I was, we were going through a, a time when, when uh, we were downsizing significantly um to change our lifestyle so that we could do ministry work full time and uh so we sold off you know bedroom sets and it's one couple came in and they wanted to purchase the bedroom set in the in the couch and then they said we want the we want to buy your kitchen table and chairs and which had come from the thrift shop but and i said to my husband they want to buy the kitchen table and chairs and he said give it to them. I'm like, but what are we going to sit on? <laughs> this is a few years ago. He says, don't worry. He said, if the Lord wants you to have kitchen chair, kitchen table and chairs, you will have it. And so I went out there and I said, okay, you can have that too. And that summer we went through three more sets of kitchen table, kitchen table and chairs. It's true. If the Lord wants you to have something, he will open the doors so that you can find, you can get what you need. What we were doing is I would go to the thrift shop. I, I would find another table and chairs, bring it home. And I would actually clean it up, paint it up, fix it up and flip it and, and sell it. So 
the Lord will always help you acquire stuff if you need to acquire stuff. So don't be ashamed when you're starting out and you don't have a lot at home. It'll, it'll grow in time. Remember, debt, again, as I said before, is not your friend. Credit cards, you know, you get a job, you're, you're married now, you're going to be on uh, every credit card list and they're going to want you to spend credit cards and it's going to be very easy to do it. It's not your friend. There are high interest rates. It'll take you, may take you, you may intend to all just pay this off in two months and then that'll be it. And you might do that. And then again, you might not. And that can be hanging over your head for years and years. So, you know, it's exciting to be able to afford, you know, a new you know, furniture that you need. But everything that you do, everything that you bring into your home to build that home up, do it together, step by step, and counsel each other with the finances that you have available. You know, the Lord has, you may think that, well, this is the only way I'm going to be able to get this item that we need for our home. You know what? Stop and pray stop and pray or even over the simplest things because the lord has a thousand ways to answer your prayers thing ways that you have never ever considered and i've been through that myself so i can tell you that's true so what is unrealistic i mentioned this before thinking that your new home will be just like what your parents have had or better after decades of their lives together um Here's another temptation that happens to young couples when in regarding in regards to going into debt and saying, well, we're married now. We have to have a couch. We have to have a living room set. We have to have a kitchen set and that type of thing. And you can justify it. You know, where are people going to, you know, sit if they come to our house or whatever, you know, there's ways you can justify it and you can say, well, she, the lady, well, you can go to work and, um you and then she'll pay for it she'll go to work and she'll pay for these items that we are purchasing well let me just caution you there in two months she might be pregnant and she might have to go on bed rest for the entire pregnancy or most of it and then you've made a purchase that um all of that responsibility for that purchase is now on him because what you were counting on, you were counting on her going out and doing work and she would pay for it and she would pay that debt off. But babies come when you're not expecting them. And very often uh, moms to be are on bed rest, sometimes for months. And so think about that before you, before you uh, ever go into debt, that can easily happen at any time. And does happen and that puts a lot of stress on the marriage because that puts much more stress on the husband to try to earn more to pay off that debt that he hadn't been counting on having to do but now there's a baby coming and so once the baby's there then you have a whole bunch more expenses so resist the temptation that apple has sitting out there of the debt and the credit card that's being sent to you just try to live within your means and make do with other ways and be patient. The Lord will, will, Lord will help you get your needs over time. In supporting one another, this is a very important topic here. Supporting another one. As much as you prepare for marriage and you're, while you're single, you're preparing yourself and all these different things, learning how to cook and clean and laundry and and how to take care of children, you know, of, of friends and family or whatever. Remember that as much as you prepare, you still, neither one of you is marrying a perfect spouse. Ladies, he may be wonderful, kind, gentle, handsome, you know, everything you wanted, he's still not perfect. And men, she may be gorgeous, beautiful, the love of your life, she's still not perfect. So just recognize that. And so both of you will have flaws. You will have weaknesses, things that will come to your attention 
after you're married and living together that you didn't notice before because you weren't living together. And in little, in little simple things, little ways. So you will both have, and look at them as, not as, well, this is your fault, you know, and, you know, demean the other person. Think of it as things that they can improve on and that you can help that person, your spouse, improve on. So talk with them about situations. I mean, this is, you know, talk about uh, openly with each other. Don't, don't just harbor, you know, resentment and not say anything. If there's things that concern you, talk openly, humbly, humbly. One of the, the remember, what was the sin of um, Lucifer that caused him to be cast out of heaven? What was the root sin? Anybody know? What was the character istic that he had that caused his, what was it, Thomas? Jealousy. Jealousy, yes. And something else too. He wanted to, he wanted to be higher than Jesus. He wanted yes. to have more authority than Jesus. Yes, he did. But it was also pride. Pride, pride would, right. Pride caused his downfall. There, Denise says pride. Pride caused Amen. his downfall. Pride caused his glorifying himself his self-exaltation to where he wanted to be not only like god he wanted to be above god and he wanted to be above jesus and he didn't like it that you know god conferred this honor upon jesus that he thought he should have as a created angel and so pride is the one thing that will help your character eradicating pride not not and that doesn't mean um, getting rid of your self-respect and integrity, but it is the self-exaltation, the, um, well, you know what pride is. It's, you know, I deserve this. I should have that. I, you know, you have to do this for me. You have to do that for me. That won't work in a, in a marriage relationship and, and for marriage to go smoothly. So when you're sharing, when you're talking to your spouse or, you're, you know, you're in courtship and you're talking to somebody. Um, talk to them very humbly and try to put, ask for pride to be removed from your life. There will be no pride in heaven. That is the root of all sin. And so we have to, that's, that's why sanctification and the purification of our characters is so important and is the, it is one of the basic foundations of our marriage relationships is to get that pride out of there for our spouses and for other people. Um, also, talk to them in a non-accusing way. And I'm sure if you're bringing up something and it may not even be, and here's the thing, it may not even be something they're doing wrong. And maybe you have a preference that something is done a certain way and uh, it may, may not even be anything wrong. It's just your preference. You know what? Give and take. You know, um, you might like to have towels um, made in perfect squares. And uh, she might like to have all her, all her towels rolled up. You know what? It doesn't really matter. We don't have to, you know, butt heads over <laughs> um, which way the towels look. And that's just kind of a, a basic example. But... If he likes the towels rolled up, all right, we'll roll up the towels. I don't care. We'll just have them organized and put away. So be willing to give and take, even if you think it's kind of silly or whatever, if, if it's a big issue for them, give in to your partner, give in to your spouse of what their preference is. Listen to them. They might be pointing something out that uh, they think you could do better on and uh, be willing to listen and think, well, maybe, yeah, I guess you have a you have a good point there. Or listen to their suggestions about organizing. You know, and um, with myself and my husband here, I'll tell you, he has better ideas about organizing than I do. And at first, you know, we kind of, I thought, well, I should be the one doing it. And, and then I watched what he did and I thought, yeah, you do. You do have some good ideas. So if he wants to organize things, I tell him, go ahead. I have seen that his 
his ideas are usually better than mine and that's okay it doesn't everything doesn't have to be that's her job or her territory that's his job and his territory you know you're working together for the good of both of you and so we have to we have to be willing to give and give and share there give and take there also remember if you are tearing each other down you're destroying your home if you're you know uh good thing to do is always have dishes done at the end of the day before you go to bed. Ideally, that's great. So when you wake up, there's no dishes on the on the counter. And uh, you might have to, maybe that was something that uh, he was raised that was done in his home and it wasn't in her home. And so you have, to, and so she's used to not worrying about it. He likes it done. You have to kind of come together and say, you know what, it is nicer to have these things taken care of. And so be willing to adjust your, your ways. And so that is the best for both of you. Um, but be careful about the words you use, because I'll tell you, those words that are used that are uh, unkind can cut through the heart terribly. And they can cause unseen damage that can accumulate for years and years, and it will gradually tear you apart. And you won't see it, but it, but you but but you know it's there. So be careful of the words that you use and how you say it to somebody, the other person. Not that you have to walk on eggshells, but you know, be approach conflicts in a method of trying to help uh, the situation for both of you. And realize you both came from different backgrounds. So it's kind of like when I was talking about that running in a three-legged race yesterday where two people are standing together and you and you and you put a rope around your legs that are touching and you start to walk and then you try to run and then you try to race against other people. You know, you have to give and take. You have to adjust yourselves to the other person so that you can work together as a unit. And that's what happens in the in a marriage. Household duties, you know what? Help each other. It's both of your home. There is no, that's her job, that's his job. You know, it's really both of your job. It's your home. And so I'll just give you a couple of hints. Um, schedule your week out. Now, one of the hardest things that I will tell you that took me years to finally figure out <laughs> And when I, when I did, I just remembered how my mom used to do things. And I thought, oh, I should have done what she did. But for years, especially with, with uh, raising children, having the house prepared for Sabbath was a big challenge. And so I grew up thinking, you know, Friday is a preparation day. And so in my mind, okay, we're going to start preparing everything on Friday. And well, yes, Friday is a preparation day, but I'm going to just submit to you to consider this. The whole week is the preparation day, is the whole, is the preparation time for the Sabbath. There's, there's nothing worse than trying to get everything done and squeezed in on Friday before sundown. And then you find out, and then you're like still getting, trying to get prepared, going two hours after into the sunset. And you're going, oh, it's dark out and I'm still doing this, I'm still doing this, and you're feeling guilty and the thing is about sabbath preparation in a in a home is is uh think about your schedules and start on sunday that's that's what we do start planning out what you're going to do each day so i used to do that for years try to do everything on friday friday um if i was at home or after i got home from work and it does not work the thing that works is planning out your week ahead of time and starting on Sunday. So for example, what's like, what does that mean? On so like Sunday through Tuesday, we're doing laundry and doing a little bit each day, okay? Wednesday and Thursday, we are going shopping and we're thinking on Wednesday, what are we gonna have for Sabbath? And so Wednesday and Thursday shopping day. And what I try to do is, I try to have as much done before Friday, so that Friday 
is, well, it is the preparation day. We're doing the last few things that we have to do to prepare for Sabbath so that by the time sundown comes, we are not uh, just struggling and running ragged, but we can approach the sundown relaxed, happy, and at peace and everything is done. So the only way I've, we've been able to figure this out, I've been able to figure this out, is you start on Sunday and you figure out what you need to do each day with a goal in mind of being having your home prepared by sundown Friday night. And that has, that has worked. Um, here's some things. I have some notes here for, for first for the ladies. And then I have some notes here just for the men um, in, in supporting each other. So ladies, listen and support your husband in the work that he does. Very, very, it's very important. Listen to, listen to what he has to say when he comes home. Support him. He's doing the best he can. And he needs your love and your acceptance of him at home and especially respect. Remember, we read in the Bible yesterday how it talks over and over about men love your wives because that's what wives need. They need to feel they're being loved by their husbands. But husbands, in addition to feeling loved, they need to feel respected. That is what happened. That is what is really important to them, that they are being respected. So your home is his place of refuge. So you want to make it as pleasant as possible. If he's going out there every day and trying to earn a living to support you, he's going out there, as somebody told me one time, it's like slaying the beast. But when he comes home, that is his refuge. That is his castle, no matter how big or small or, or whatever it is. Even the most simplest of homes can make him feel like a king when he comes home. So how do we do that? Make our surroundings pleasant. Uh, try to have things organized. If we keep things organized all, of, all, all the time, it work, things work much better than trying to rush at the last minute. Ladies, make yourselves attractive and pleasant so that he wants to rush home to be with you, his best friend, his lover, his lifelong partner, that he can always depend on. You don't want him dreading coming home. Also, ladies, when he comes home, he's been working all day. Don't meet him at the door with complaining and arguments. And, you know, Mary's, Mary's brothers, sisters, wives, whatever, did this to me today. Let those, don't do that. Let those things be talked about later. He needs to have you, he needs to be received and, and be, you know, taken care of, help him. He needs to relax and feel like he's at peace now that he's finally home. It makes, when that happens to a man, it makes it all worthwhile, all the hard work that he's had to go through the whole entire day for the purpose of bringing money into the family to sustain your home. So bring up those things that concern you, bring those things up with him later on. When he comes home, give him your attention. Honey, I'm so happy to see you. How was your day? Well, you know, just, just lather on the love and uh, they will love it. They will come straight home to you. Um, yes, when he's rested and when he has energy to deal with problems, then talk to him about it. But he comes home and he's tired and he's haggard. And you say, honey, we got, a, we got a dripping faucet. And he's thinking, oh my goodness. He's thinking about all the stuff that's just happened to him all day long, all of the meetings and whatever. And now I'm coming home and I'm getting another laundry list more on top of my head. And it can be just a very self-defeating um, feeling for a man and to where they lash out out of self-protection. I can't handle it. So hold off on those things. Try to manage in things as much as you can. Here's the other thing too, ladies. Learn whatever you can from your husband. He has skills that he can do. And uh, 
you know, he's out working on the car, go out there and watch him, ask him what he's doing. What, how are you doing that? So that you can learn how to do the same thing too. And same thing with men, you know, your wives are good at cooking and maybe you're not, ask them how they're doing that. You know, learn from each other. Ladies, we tend to, oftentimes when we're complaining, we're just venting. We're just letting off steam. Well, you know, this happened and then that happened and then this happened. And that really tends to tax men after a while. Men are wired to fix things. And then, and when we're complaining or just venting, they have nothing to fix. And so it can end, we can end up complaining and kind of endlessly sound like we're endlessly rambling on and they might just get tired and really resentful. So just keep that in mind. They are inclined to fix problems. That's just how men are wired. Women are inclined to want to talk out their feelings and that can take a long time. And so if you load that all on your guy, when he comes home, he's going to probably not be very happy if it, especially if it happens day after day after day. So just have restraint and think about when to bring something up. And if, am I really bringing this up to him because it's important or am I just, you know, maybe I'll just go talk to a girlfriend about something and vent that way. But be careful, don't vent personal things about your husband to your girlfriends. That's not good. You, we wouldn't want our husbands to be venting their personal frustrations about us to other men. That's, that's a boundary we don't, we don't want to break around our home. So that's just a few ideas here. Now for the men. We ladies are very physically complex beings. And when you think about it, you say, well, I know that. No, we really are. <laughs> when you think about it, God designed our bodies to produce another living human being, which is absolutely incredible. But consequently, in order for us to do that, our energy levels are going to vary throughout the month. Our physical abilities are going to vary throughout each month. Our hormones, we have very complex hormones that are affecting us in ways that sometimes we don't even understand at times, much less you, the men. You know, men don't have this roller coaster of hormones going through them every single month. And so sometimes we are very calm and easygoing, and sometimes we're on edge, you know, anxiety. Um, understand. And, and ladies, that's not an excuse to be, you know, you know, just say, well, it's just my hormones. That's not good either. We need to try to maintain control of our, our um, control of ourselves. But do understand men that we are very complex and those hormones do affect us. Those natural chemical fluctuations in us can make us feel like a roller coaster. We might be able to have all the energy in the world and I might be able to clean the entire house today and uh, have everything look beautiful. And then tomorrow, I may be sick in bed and can't do a thing. That's just how it is for us ladies. It's, you know, so just something for men to be aware of. So don't resent us when this happens. Just please be patient with us. We don't like it either. It's not, we don't enjoy it. But that's the price that we pay as, you know, God created us. So what do you do in those situations? Just help support do what you can to help out in encourage sympathize honey this will go away you'll be okay um reassure that reassurance a kind word is is the love that ladies are are looking for and see i know i know you'll get back you'll bounce back you'll be you know okay um not just dismissing how she's feeling but reassuring her this will pass and you'll be back and be encouraged. That will give you, probably get you more cookies or whatever, but you know, it's, um, it's important to have that encouragement. And uh, tomorrow you may have your usual happy wife back again. So just be aware of that. Something else, men, we ladies cry easy and we don't cry for the same reasons. We can cry because we're angry. We cry because we're in pain. We cry because we're happy. Uh, 
I can cry at commercials if I was watching TV. <laughs> it's like things in movies, we cry easily. So don't let that shake you. And, and then when there is a baby on the way, we can cry for absolutely no reason at all. I remember there were times when, you know, my son or daughter was on the way and I'd be crying my eyes out. And my husband would say, are you crying because you're upset or are you crying because you're just crying? And I would sit, I would stand, <laughs> sit there and, and just say, I am, there's absolutely nothing wrong. I'm perfectly happy. And yet I was crying my eyes out. That's the hormones. That's what they do. And so, you know, when you see a reaction in your wife, men, and you're like, what's going on? Just stop and ask, try to, and try to get them to tell, tell you, because especially in pregnancy, you don't know, you know, we just cry for whatever it just cries. We don't even have a, and nothing's wrong. That's the hormones changing our, our bodies. Um, also men, as you know, and look around you for people who've been married longer, but your bride will, your bride will likely not look the same as she did, did on your wedding day. Don't hold that against her. She's not going to have that perfect bride body for the rest of her life, likely. Sometimes, but not likely. Not always. More often than not. So don't hold that against her. Um, something else here. Now for both of you. Oh, oh, one other, one other important thing too. This is very important for men to understand that you may not have been told before. Uh, many ladies have been sexually abused as children to in varying degrees and many more than you would ever realize. And uh, um, if that has happened to your uh, wife and, uh, and ladies, you know, if you're getting married, I would tell, tell your husband if that's the case, because that is going to affect your marriage and it's going to affect your intimacy. And so men need to understand that. Uh, I don't know, how, how should I say this? Um, it's going to affect, I mean, you may be expecting one thing intimately and uh, want to do certain things intimately. And if your wife has been sexually abused as a child, even a little bit, you know, you may find that she just recoils and freezes up and don't get mad at her. That is a natural reaction. So that's something you need to work through together. But men need to understand that if a woman has been molested or abused sexually as a child or as a teenager, understand she will likely have some kind of reaction, not, and not that she wants to, but she just will have a reaction in intimate situations with you. And so be patient with her and listen to her and, and ladies talk to him, say, you know, don't touch me that from that angle. Don't touch me this way. Don't touch me that way. Work together. That's so important for people to understand. Um, especially because it's happened to so many women when they were children. Um, so as I'm talking about this, you know, these are, we are talking about, these are things that do have to do with compatibility and getting along and working together throughout your marriage. Another thing to be concerned to talk about um, in, in, in regards to compatibility is what will you leave, what will you allow to come into your home? What will you allow in your home? What will you say that's that stays at the door? That's not coming in our home. That's something that very think about Philippians 4 8 as your guide. Um, can somebody read that? Uh, Thomas, can you read that for me? Philippians 4 8, if you can go off mute. Um, if you're there. I think he's there. Philippians 4.8. Yes, I am. Okay. If you could read that for me, I'd appreciate that. 
Guard what comes in your home. What do you allow in your home and not in your home? Your home is not, that, that door does not need to be allow anything that wants to come in, to come in. So you just Philippians, have second, almost there. yeah, no problem. Philippians 4 is a good guide as to finally, what we allowed. Okay. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatso, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatever things are lovely and whatever things are good report. If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Thank you. Oh. Whatsoever things are pure, true, have virtue, lovely. These are the things that we're to think about. These are the things this is a good standard by which of what you're going to allow in your home, because what you allow in your home is going to influence you. And you may think, oh, it's not going to, it's not a big deal. It is, it is a big deal. So, so you might say, well, give me some examples. First thing I'm going to talk about here. So I have a number here. Um, video games. Video games are very popular for uh dads especially and for children and uh having gone through and raising children and so forth i would say do not allow any video games in the home they are destructive you may think well you know my my child you know it's it's ed educational you know what one thing leads to another well we got this video game and it was good for you know baby johnny and then we'll get, he's growing, so we'll get him this video game. And yeah, it's educational. And now he's a little bit older. Well, we'll get him this game because it will, you know, you can justify it all along. And you know what you end up with? It's not good. It's, you end up with men who are in their 20s, 30s that are, um, can you hear me okay? Somebody said, check your audio. Can any, everybody hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I Those can video hear you. Somebody else. Okay. All right. So video games. Um, if I had to do over, I would never allow a video game or a console in my house. That is the one of the biggest, just even though that, you know, it's, there was cute, see nice, see nice things for children. Uh, you end up with men in their 20s and 30s sitting in their parents living in their parents basements in a bedroom um living their whole lives on video games that's where it ends up it makes it makes children aggressive towards each other um i've seen situations where you know uh there were children in the home and the one was really into video games and as soon as he played those video games he was as mean as a snake to his brother and sister and but yet the father was very much into video games and so it was hard for the mother to keep, get those video games out so no video games if you have them in there there i would take them out and uh I, no exception in my my rule book now no exceptions not not gaming computers to learn how to use computers that's one thing but gaming i would not do ever even if it seems to start out innocently. Movies. What, what does the Bible says? We are not to be unequally yoked. We are not to be united with the world. Movies, you know, in the, in the days past, they used to say we should, you know, Adventists should not be going to the theaters. Well, if you have movies on DVDs at home, that's the same thing. You're watching things that are make believe you're watching things that usually have uh destruct uh you know immoral things and think about the as my friend always says um uh she's not on here right now cindy you know she says she says talk think about those actors you know they're often in in bed doing love scenes with somebody that they're not even married to there is um you know these fictional movies that are come out from the theaters Keep them out of your homes. They affect you. You may not think it, but they do affect you. Fiction books and novels. 
there's no there's no place for those in the Christian home. Um, even some magazines depends on the magazine. You really need to look through your home carefully. So if you already have you know all these things in your home, I know when I was making major reforms in my home years ago, I remember going through my house three times with a trash bag and I was looking at every single thing. And the question was, is this something that honors God or does it detract and take me away from God? And if it detracted, it went in the trash can and I had to go through the house three times and I filled up that trash bag. So they can, you know, these things can just kind of acquire into your homes, but they need to go. If you're, if you are, we're at this late stage that we are at now where Jesus is coming soon and we have to be preparing ourselves for the seal of God, we can't have those things in our homes. We have to, we're either all in God's court or not at all. There is no straddling the fence. Well, I'll have these religious things, but I'll, I want to keep this thing over here. This is okay. No, when we go to heaven, we're going to be living in, in God's kingdom and everything there is going to be pure and holy. And this is our preparation now. And so you're not, you're not depriving yourself. You're helping give yourself a more strong, um, stable home. Uh, choice of music. Remember, holy angels are in your home. They're recording everything you say, everything you do, everything you listen to. Um, you go on YouTube. YouTube will always suggest these things of music that maybe you liked in the past. You need to go in check not interested not interested don't show me because the devil will try to treat try to tempt you to let's go look at that video remember that group you used to like um just let's go listen to them that won't hurt one time that's the devil tempting you we need to make sever those connections uh televisions televisions are satan's pipeline into your home i know people like their televisions but uh, think about the content that's on them. Think what they're promoting nowadays. Is it true? Think about Philippians 4.8. And you might say, well, I need it for the news. Well, do you? Or can you get the news on the internet? Most, we all have the internet because we're, the, we're talking on the internet now. But uh, you can get your news on the internet. You don't need to have a television. You don't need to have commercials that your children are watching where they're promoting LGBTQ. So I have not had television in my home for, wow, probably going on 20 years. And I don't miss it at all. I got plenty to do. <laughs> so yeah, we don't need the televisions in our homes. It indoctrinates you, it indoctrinates your children, and it's not to the glory of God. And no porn. There should be no porn in our homes at all or on our computers. Now, think about outside activities. What are you doing outside? When, when you're married now, let's assume you're all married and you're done with the courtship and you've decided and you've gotten married. Remember, you're married. You're no longer single. Now that you're married, you have a lot of responsibilities that you, know, you didn't have when you were single. And it's not just for taking care of you, it's taking care of your spouse too. And maybe children or children that are on their way. So outside activities, um, you have to rethink about what you're gonna do outside the home. You know, the men, uh, you know, that might've been used to going out with their friends and having fun and, you know, bombing around, walking around, going here, going there. When you have a wife, that doesn't work anymore. The two of you are a unit, are a couple. Now, to say that you can't go to your friend's house for a couple hours and visit with them or whatever, you know, that's one thing. But to have a repeated activity where you might say, well, I'm married now, but I'm, I'm still going to go have my friends and I'm going to do this. And you leave your wife at home and then the children come and you leave her at home taking care of the babies. That is going to make for a very unstable and not good marriage. Um, so, and single people. You know, sometimes you say, well, they got married. They don't talk to me anymore. Well, that's because their lives have significantly changed. 
again, they have responsibilities and uh, no, they're not single anymore and they don't have the time and they have a whole different, you know, uh, structure of life. And so, but it is nice to get together with other married couples and socialize and so forth. There's nothing wrong with that, but uh, it, your life is much different once you're married. And that kind of brings me to where I wanted to talk about um, temperament. And let me see, I'm going to switch my camera over here to some slides that, um, let's see. Okay, so hopefully you can see that. I'm gonna advance these slides. And okay, you should see on your screen where it says four temperaments. Do you see that all? Everyone see that? Yeah, we see it. Or I see it. Oh, okay, perfect. Thank you. So I under, this is something just to be aware of in our compatibility, in our, um, you know, how we are naturally, our, our natural personalities are, we vary. And I just want you to make, be, you may have heard of this, you may not have heard of this, but there are kind of four basic temperaments and they have different characteristics that are typical to that character. And not everybody is in one group or the other. Usually we're, we have a combination, but we might lean more towards one than we do another. So just one of them just to be, now where it says stable and unstable, I don't like those that they put that there it's different. It's not that they're unstable, but um, this is just a one of the graphics that I wanted to show you to kind of give you an idea of the characteristics. The people who are of a sanguine type of a temperament tend to be people who are likely to be in leadership, lively, easygoing, responsive, talkative, outgoing, sociable, um, usually salesmen are usually of this, of this uh, temperament, is what you want to call it. Um, then there's another people, there's another temperament called phlegmatic. And this is, they, they misspelled it. It should say calm, not clam. Uh, calm, even tempered, reliable, controlled, peaceful, thoughtful, careful, and passive. Then there's, a, then there's a, a temperament called choleric where they tend, those people tend to be active, optimistic, impulsive, changeable, excitable, aggressive, touchy. Touchy means, you know, uh, maybe kind of moody. So think about, you know, it's, it's, you can take tests to see where you are in these different temperaments. And, and then think about, and then have your, and you can take the test and you can have your um, spouse take it or your loved one take it that you're considering marrying and see where they are and recognize your, str your different strengths and the different aspects of you. Um, melancholy people, melancholic. These tend to be quiet, unsociable people. Not that that's bad. They are introverted on the introverted scale Phlegmatics and melancholies are introverted. What does introverted mean? Uh, introverted means that, in a simple way to put it, is when you need to get recharged, if I should say, good way to say it, if you want to get recharged, you want to be alone and have it quiet. And that rebuilds your energy sources. Whereas extro extroverted people, tend to want to be around people a lot because that's what gives them energy. So you can have a unbalanced or you can have a, one person can be introverted, one person can be extroverted. And you may have some conflicts there because the person who's introverted may want to stay home more and you know just do quiet things around the house and uh, you know working on the home or whatever. And if the extroverted person is in, in that, in that uh, relationship, you know, they're gonna wanna be going out and doing things with groups and that can cause friction. So you want to recognize that and understand that to be able to give and take there if you are in a situation with an extrovert 
and an introvert and recognize that the extrovert isn't a bad person and the introvert isn't bad either. It's just different. And so you have to come together as to what you're willing to do together. Otherwise, you're going to be separated. Um, so let's see, what else do they do? So melancholy, quiet, unsociable. I wouldn't say they're unsociable. They're just quiet. Reserved. I wouldn't say they're necessarily, at least say pessimistic. Sober, rigid, anxious, moody. That kind of makes them look kind of bad, but they're, they're, they're more on a quiet side. I wouldn't say that, you know. Here's another one uh, that will help you maybe. These, these actually have some Bible characters in them. They're, here's choleric, phlegmatic, melancholy, sanguine, sanguine that we just talked about. And here's some other temperament styles. Uh, some people tend to be more of a driver type personality. They're assertive. They want to get things done. They want to get it done now. Now, if you are of that type and your spouse is um, uh, amiable, sanguine, you may, be, you may overwhelm that person that's a sanguine, that is not assertive, maybe who is more careful about things. So that can cause conflicts. And the other thing too is you can be adaptable in these different things too. I took a test once and I was like right in the middle, <laughs> right in the like crosshairs. And I went, oh, okay. And uh, yeah, I can kind of jump into either any one of these styles is um, pretty easily. But, um, but just understand that the, a driver personality like Joshua, you know, these are like masterminds, inventors, architects. Um, they can, they aren't necessarily over emotional. And so if you are uh, a sanguine that is very, or, or a phlegmatic who has a lot of emotions and your spouse is a driver that doesn't have a lot of emotions, that can, you need to understand, you need to recognize that and adapt for each other to help each other so that you're not being driven apart um analytical people these are um usually non-assertive people not overly expressive um might be called melancholy but they're like guardians supervisors inspectors um might have very low emotion um i would pick a picture of this chart if you have a if you can with your phone or something it's something good just to be aware of um amiable uh like solomon uh how many wives did he have 800 something like that um stable emotion emotively expressive not assertive he got led into what happened to solomon he got led into uh paganism by his wives uh, David, expressive. These people, high emotion. Uh, teachers, idealists, counselors, champions, healers. And you can have different parts of this in your um, person, different parts. I, I did a little test last night to see where I was. And I think, or was I? I was over, heavily over here, phlegmatic and sanguine. But I still had a num a, quite a bit of both of these in me as well. Um, so you can tell what people have by, you take a test and answer questions and you can tell where you lean towards. So that's important to understand. Um, also, I'll tell you too, when you're, when you're working out in the business field and you may have to, you know, kind of adjust your personality to be in a driver mode, uh, depending on the type of work that you're doing. And you have a, you have a spouse who is sanguine that is not overly assertive uh when you come home you may have to just your you may have to hold back relax and so that you can relate better to your spouse that might be of a totally different temperament because if you go home with that same mentality in your mind as you've been doing all day you may overwhelm your spouse and that will cause a lot of trouble too so um, just something to be aware of, something to be aware of. 
because if there's conflicts, chances are some of it might may apply to this too. And then there's here's another picture about strength and weaknesses of each of one of them. Sanguine, melancholy, melancholy. You know, there's their strengths on the outside. They're outgoing and charismatic, warm, friendly, but sanguines can sometimes be restless, disorganized, unproductive, undependable. You know, all these maybe fearful, maybe insecure. So you might want to take a picture of this if you can take one too. So there's strength and weaknesses in each one. And so this is, this is all compatibility. So you want to recognize what you are, what your partner is, where you tend to, um, you know, have more of your characteristics in and recognize what that, that character, that personality or temperament tends to be strong in and tends to be weak in and help each other. Knowledge is, is power. Um, let's see how we do it on time, 1230. Okay, some other things about compatibility. And then I wanted to just show you some, oh, okay, let me see. Other things about compatibility when you are um, in you in the courtship phase that you wanna maybe talk about. Uh, talk, you know, you wanna look at your personal religious life when you're courting somebody, yours versus theirs. Ask them what they do. Um, you know, and people can change too. People can, you know, adjust and change as they are, as they are growing. Uh, talk about family religion. Are you going to have family worship together? Are you going to have morning worship and evening worship or just one or just the other? This is a compatibility issue. Uh, something else to talk about is when you have children, training them, child, child training of religion. Are you going to send them to church school or are you going to send them to public school or are you going to homeschool them these things should be discussed during the courtship period if one person is and as if you find during courtship you say no we really don't seem to match up very well and not really willing to bend it is okay to go separate ways even if you are in the point where you having you have an engagement and you're looking closely at these things and you're saying, you know, we are way too far apart on these and it's not really something we can come together on. It's okay to break an engagement. It's better to break an engagement than to follow through, get married and have decades of a unhappy marriage. And nobody should want that for anybody. Um, other compatibility issues, keeping the Sabbath. How will you keep the Sabbath? What will you do? How will you prepare for it? Uh, it really does take both of you to work on it, preparing all week long, I found. Uh, don't leave it all up to one person. Work together. But how will you keep the Sabbath? What will you do? What will you not do? What kind of traditions will you build into your family? Um, other compatibility. Uh, dividing up responsibilities in the home. Who does what? Are you rigid? Say that's his job and that's her job. And, you know, you stay out of my kitchen and you stay out of my garage. Or are you going to be flexible and work together? I would suggest being flexible and working together. It's going to be much more compatible. Um, also things, again, for compatibility, we kind of touched on some of these things. Uh, don't managing finances and managing money. I'll just talk, touch on a couple of things that we didn't talk about. Don't ever assume something regarding finances and don't ever just avoid the topic. Avoiding subjects um, and making assumptions is not good. Communication is the key to your marriage. Even if it's difficult, um, Sometimes, and I'll tell you something else, sometimes it's hard to, uh, it may be hard for one person to verbalize something. And if that's the case, have them write it out. It might be easier to actually write it out. And also there may be cases where one person thinks they're communicating something, but they're really not. And you might even, if you're finding that, you're having trouble with um, 
discussing something and then he or she says well i've already told you 10 times and you're like i i, I missed it you know what you might just say let me just let me say it again let me write it down because the person who may be communicating may think they are expressing clearly all of their thoughts and that this going on inside of them but when it's written down they may read it and realize they haven't expressed what the, what's really going on inside of them so use you know verbal skills written skills um whatever you need to do to communicate thoroughly together and it's okay to you know write something down and hand it to them um so that you make sure that you're not missing something uh other things in, in regards to finances, again, is covetousness. You know, you see something, I want it. I want that over there. Not just a person, but you want, I want that. I, I have to have that kind of a car. I have to have that kind of a refrigerator. I have to have that. That's really getting into covetousness. We need to be, we need to be um, happy to live within our means selfishness is something also that can be a huge problem with finances where one person thinks that they have to have all these different things for themselves wants versus needs that can cause conflict um another thing too is in regards to future children you know before you have children what's going to happen when you do have children does is she going to stay home and raise the children Will you adjust your lifestyle so that only one person is needed to support the home? Um, and if she's going to work, who's going to take care of the children? And what impact is that on there, on those children? It's really important that, that, that mom be home with those children. Those first, those first seven years of a child's life um, is their whole character forming period. By the time they're seven years old, their character, this is why I think it says that their character is formed in that first seven years. So as far as possible, mom needs to be home um, with those children, raising them and instilling, instilling principles in them. And the principles that will last them a lifetime. I can tell you from myself, I actually remember a lot when I was a kid. Um, when I some of the things that I learned about lifestyle, about, um, you know, not doing drugs and that type of thing when I was, I learned when I was five, six, seven years old, going to Sabbath school. They, they taught that to us and that's where I learned it. And by the time I was eight, nine, 10, when I was at times going to public school and I would see friends of mine that were talking about those types of things. I already knew by that time that they were wrong to do. And so instilling these principles in children when they are very young is very, very important. Long before they even have to get to those um, older ages where they have things that confront them. Uh, let's see here. Some behaviors that damage relationships and marriages that we don't want to do. Uh, being passive aggressive. Ladies, we tend to do that. We'll say, he'll say something, he'll say, well, what's wrong? And we'll go, nothing. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm perfectly fine. <laughs> My husband's laughing at me. Yes, ladies, we tend to be passive aggressive. That's not good. Communicate. You know, we, we can't read our husband's minds and our husbands can't read our minds. And so when we act that way, what are we doing? We're tearing our home apart. Let's not do that. It's easy to fall into it. It's not good. Keeping secrets and hiding things from each other is not good. We should be able to tell our um, spouse anything. So keep that in mind. I, I was on a Facebook group just this last week and they were saying something about uh, where is your favorite place to hide things that you've purchased from your husband? And so a lot of them were saying where there was and a lot of them were saying 
why are you hiding things from your husband? Which I agreed with. I said, you shouldn't be hiding things. You know, you're a unit, you're a team. You know, this is your best friend that hopefully you'll be going into eternity with. This isn't somebody that you're going to be, this is not your enemy that you're hiding from. Don't hide things. Don't keep secrets. It's going to, when it, they get, when it gets found out, it's just going to just, you know, um, tear down that relationship. Uh, don't try to make your, your spouse jealous by uh, trying to attract attention from the other sex. You're married now. This is the person you're committed to. You're committed to them for life. Don't play games, men or women. Don't flirt with others so that you're, because you're being passive aggressive and you're, you know, wanting to make um, that person, making your spouse jealous and, and that don't play games. If that's what's, if that's what's happening, there's maturity that needs to be gained there. Don't ever, don't ever do that. Uh, be careful about allowing your uh, parents and friends to interfere with your marriage. There is a sacred circle around your marriage, around your home. And uh, there's things that you make, you can share with parents and friends. There's things you don't share. They should stay within the closed doors of your home. And don't let them be interfering. Um, they, they may give you counsel. But you know what? They shouldn't be dictating. You do this and you do that. Um, no, you are a family unit. So be careful there. Um, drugs, alcohol, and porn are going to damage and uh, can destroy a marriage. They sh sh you, don't, you don't want those in there. Worldly influences. Worldly influences, even among Adventist families, can be very damaging. It can be a slippery slope. Well, we'll just, you know, um, read, read the spirit of prophecy. You'll learn so much there, but we're supposed to come apart from worldly influences. Uh, again, television and video games have no place uh, in Christian homes. They really don't. I would get your news elsewhere just because there's so much on television that you cannot escape. Um, not communicating, not resolving issues that is going to damage a relationship, damage a, a marriage. You need to find ways to communicate, even if you're writing letters to each other, to be able to fully express what's going on in your head. If you can't verbalize it, write it down, read it. And then if you're, if you're comfortable, then give it to your spouse. If that's how you communicate, people can communicate better sometimes writing and speaking. Also not being willing to let go of having your own way. It's okay to not have to have your own way. You know, let your, let your spouse have their own way. There's, there's a lot of things that, you know, if you're easygoing, it's, it's not as, as big of a deal for you. If you have two people who are like the driver temperament where they have to have things their way, they're, gonna, they're going to, um, you know, come into conflict. So be willing to give and take, you know, Think about it. Does it really matter if you know we have the, the the forks in this side of the drawer or that side of the drawer? You know, if if he wants it there, fine. Put the forks over there. It doesn't matter. Um, we don't always have to have our way. Ladies, some qualities to be sought in a prospective husband. Before be giving her hand in marriage. Every woman should inquire. This is from Adventist Home 47. Every woman should inquire whether he with whom she is about to unite her destiny is worthy. Ladies, what has been his past record? And is his life pure? Uh, is the love which he expresses of a noble elevated character? Or is it a mere emotional fondness? Um, keep in mind when you get to know somebody, you know, people do have pasts and they aren't always, a, they, people don't always stay the same now as they were in the past. So you want to get to know the full circumstances of the background of that person you're considering to marry. Um, 
Has he the traits of a character that will make her happy? Can she find true peace and joy in his affection? There are some people who don't have effect, who don't, who actually feel it is a strength to withhold affection from their spouse. I don't understand that, but I know of people that are like that. Um, is she, is the wife, <laughs> to be wife, okay with that? Will she be allowed to preserve her personality? Or must her judgment and conscience be surrendered to the control of her husband? You know, you should not have to surrender your, all your judgment and your conscience to your husband. You should be able to come to a point where you both can agree on things. You still, wives still have the right to maintain their own personalities and individuality, but it should come and, you know, work together. Can she honor the Savior's claims as supreme? Can she keep the Sabbath? Something else too. Uh, the lady should be, should, should be, especially Seventh-day Adventist. You know, you could marry somebody who is also claims to be a Seventh-day Adventist. And after they're married, decide they're not interested anymore. And they don't want to be a Seventh-day Adventist anymore. And there you are. You're like, oh, I thought I married an Adventist. We have children now. Or I'm or going to have a child now. What do I do now? And you're left, you know, trying to raise that child as an Adventist and your spouse who was one, who is now no longer one, that poses a very difficult situation for you. So you want, that's why you want to make sure that your spouse is deeply rooted in uh, their spiritual beliefs that are compatible with yours. Um, will body and soul thoughts and purposes be preserved pure and holy? These questions have a vital bearing upon the well-being of every woman who enters the marriage relation. Let the woman who desires a peaceful, happy union, who would escape future misery and sorrow, inquire before she yields her affections. Think about his mother. What is her character like? How does he treat his mother? Oftentimes men will treat their wives like they treat their mothers. Do they treat their mothers well? Do they honor them? Chances are they'll honor, they'll treat the wife the same way and vice versa. Let's see. If he does not respect and honor his mother, will he manifest respect and love, kindness and attention toward his wife? When the novelty of marriage is over, Will he still love me? Will he be patient with my mistakes? Or will he be critical, overbearing, and dictatorial? That's why it's good to understand about these temperaments and look at what, you know, wh where you are in those temperaments and what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are and how patient you are with one another. True love um, will overlook many mistakes and you will work together uh, if you are, you know, if it's true love. Uh, ladies, accept only pure manly traits, it says. One who is, uh, let's see, let a young woman accept as a life companion only one who possesses pure manly traits of character, one who is a diligent, aspiring, and honest, one who loves and fears God. If you are Dating ladies, if you are dating somebody, it's time to make a separation. I remember I went many, many years ago, I was dating somebody who was from a Baptist family. I don't know what I was thinking, but I was. And uh, he and he had a brother who had, was a Baptist minister. And he um, told me one day what he thought about Adventists. And I thought that was it. That was <laughs> that one small conversation. And I thought, mm, I don't need to be here. This is not going, this is not going to go where I want to go in my life. And so we separated and he was
I'm going, I am an Adventist. I'm going to stay an Adventist. I want an Adventist family. And for what you're saying here about how you're feeling, that's fine for you, but it won't work for us as a couple. And so that was, I made the change there. Some qualities to be sought in a prospective wife for the men. This is also from Adventist Home, page 46. Let a young man seek one to stand by his side who is fitted to bear her share of life's burdens. One whose influence will ennoble and refine him, who will make him happy in her love. A prudent wife is from the Lord. Here's an, this is another Bible text. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her. A husband needs to be able to trust his wife. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Here's another one, another Bible text. She opened her mouth with wisdom and the tongue is in the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praiseth her saying, many daughters have done virtuously, but thou, wife, is excellent above them all. He who finds, he who gains such a wife, findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Men, if you're, if you're, you know, looking at the young ladies around you, you know, they're 16, 17, 18. Remember, they're not fully mature yet. They haven't fully. So just be, just, you know, and you're getting married. Um, you're going to have a lot of growing up to do still. So you may be looking for these, all of these virtues and not finding them and say, well, where is she? Well, women need, to, ladies have to have time to grow up as well. So you want to keep that in mind and um, things you should consider will for the men, will the one you bring, one you marry, bring happiness to your home? Is she an economist or will she, if married, not only use all her own earnings, if she's working, but all of your earnings to gratify a vanity, a love of appearance, uh, that's, that's a, that's a concern. Is your, is the woman you're considering marrying, you know, into spending tons and tons of money on her appearance, on her hair, on her clothes, on, you know, all of these outward displays that will be a problem. You know, are you, do you have enough money to cover all those types of things you want to have. And, and I, likewise, I was, um, you know, talking to my husband this morning, ladies need to understand that when we go out and we dress provocatively and we dress so that we are um, exposing our top and exposing our bottom curves. And when you're young and you do that and you are getting lots of attention from the men and you might think, oh, this is wonderful. Look at all the attention I'm getting. Keep in mind one thing. Those are not the girls the men want to bring home to mom to say, I'm going to marry. And you might say, I don't like what she's saying. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Men, young men might love to flirt and have fun and talk to girls who, uh, you know, reveal lots of skin, reveal lots of curves. But when they get serious about who is going to be the mother of their children, that's not the ones they're looking for. They're looking for the conservative girls that are dressed nicely. Those are the ones that are going to get picked up to be taken home to say, mom, this is, you know, who my future wife will be. So ladies, you know, yes, when we're young, we look beautiful. We can, you know, use our ways of wooing men, but um, keep in mind the impression you are giving to the world in your appearance because you might be attracting the kinds of people that you deep down inside you really don't want to spend the rest of your life with so just keep that in mind but it is true men 
don't look for the real flashy, um, provocative, exhibitionist type of woman to marry. They look for somebody when they're serious, they look for a different type, more conservative type. Um, in, in your choice of wife, study her character. Will she be one who will be patient and painstaking? Observe her with children. See how she treats children. Will she cease to care for your mother and father at the very time when they need a strong son to lean on? What if you were passed away and your, and your mother needed help? Would your wife-to-be be one that would go help your wife even though maybe you were not able to? These are character issues. Will she withdraw you from society to carry out her own plans and suit her own pleasure and then leave the mother and father who instead of gaining an affectionate daughter-in-law ends up where they lose their son? Just some things. This is from Adventist Home, page 46. Um, looks like we're running out of time here, but... Uh, let me just show you a few more slides here from that I had to share with you. I see there's a lot of things in the chat window. I don't have time to read them. Um, let me see if we can see that. And let me just, I have some counsels that I wanted to share with you too. Hopefully it's, I can do that here. These are some counsels for courtship that are, that uh, I extracted. Now these councils here, there are several documents that I have uploaded that uh, Brother Sammy and Brother Zadok have. He, they can share with you PDF files. This is where they come from. Uh, there's much more in those documents than I'm even gonna show you here. So I would encourage you to look through them, get a hold of them, print them, share them. Uh, you can download them to your phone and read through them. But these are councils from the Spirit of Prophecy. And a lot of these things you may never have seen before because they come from letters, letters and, and manuscripts that were only released in 2015. So online. So do look through these because I won't be able to uh, touch on everything. There is councils for courtship. There's one for unwise marriages and, and for unequally yoked. So let's see, councils, here's one of them. Uh, I've been shown the evil of these early attachments, especially when a young man is away from the home roof and must select his companion without the discriminating eye of his mother. Yes, young men, listen to your mothers. Mothers know about young ladies. They can, they can pick up things that you would never pick up on. And likewise, ladies, seek your, your dad's opinions about the young man because they will see things in that young man that you won't be able to see very important. It's not safe, she says, for you to trust your own judgment. Early anxiety on the subject of courtship and marriage will divert your mind from your work and studies and produce in you and the one who you flatter a demoralizing influence. There will be in you both a vain forwardness and manners, an infatuation which will seize you, Probably most of us have gone through an infatuation situation in our lives um, that does that. It, you'll be so completely blinded to your influence that you will, if you continue in the course you've entered on, expose yourselves to criticism and demand that censure be passed upon your course. So be careful. Don't trust your own judgment. Let me see. The next one here is, here is uh, this courtship in this particular letter. And marriage is the most difficult to manage because the mind becomes so bewildered and enchanted, like with an infatuation, that duty to God and everything else becomes tame and uninteresting. And the calm and mature thought is the last thing to be exercised in this matter of gravest importance. Dear youth, I speak to you as one who knows. Wait until you have some just knowledge of yourself and of the world and of, bearing, of the bearing and character of young women before you let the subject of marriage possess your thoughts. 
And you know what? Read, read the Spirit of Prophecy books that we've I've recommended. That'll help you a, a lot. Um, let me do this one. I look at, I look at, I look with sorrow upon the prophetess and wasted lives of young men and young ladies who, as soon as old enough, can only think of courtship and marriage. And I'm led to question in regard to their home influences, what kind of education did they receive? Did they have praying mothers? Ladies, we need to be praying for our children. Something else I want to mention, pray, 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 um, all, everyone, whether you're, well, if you're not married and for married people who have children, start praying for either your future spouse, if you are not married yet, and start, and if you are a parent with children, start praying for their future uh, spouse and their families. Start praying now. Pray for their protection, even though you don't know who they are. Start praying for your future spouse and start praying for your um, children's future spouse and their families. I was told that when I was 14, and I did. I started praying for my future spouse. I thought it was one person. Of course, it wasn't, but um, do, do that. Start praying for future spouse. Were they taught? They will like that when they hear that, when, they, when you get married. Were they taught that they were responsible for the use and improvement of the faculties God get, has given them and that they should be a blessing to others and not only form characters for heaven themselves, but, be, but seek to lead others in the same divine path? So mothers, this is what we're supposed to be teaching our children right here. The mothers of these youths might have been bending under the heavy yoke of fashion and custom and for the slavery of fashionable life, neglected to the training and education of children. The parents' neglected work will be seen in the characters of these children. I'm gonna probably stop there because we're out of time, but um, please do get a hold of the uh, PDFs that go with this. Um, yes, let's see. Um, okay, Susie so made a comment. Um, yeah, I'm about out of time here. So please download the uh, Spirit of Prophecy documents that talk about unequally yoked. There's many in here that talk about unwise marriages. And uh, if you want to talk to me further about these, you know, contact me here on Facebook. I also have my own private, um, or we have, I own, we have our own YouTube, or no, not YouTube, Zoom channel to where I could talk with people more about this. But uh, since we're out of time here, I'm going to turn it back over to um, Brother Zadok, if he's there, Brother Sammy. If they're there, and I want to thank everyone um, to for listening and considering these uh, truths and and advice. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and close out with prayer here, and then we'll close. To your Father in heaven, we just thank you again that we can learn from the counsels that you've given us. You've given us so much information, so much light from heaven that. We just need to heed what you say and trust that you do know what's best for us. Lord, I pray for each person who has been listening today, whether on Zoom or on or watch the video later. I pray that the Holy Spirit will move upon their hearts to consider these things and discuss them with their loved one that they're either married to or considering marrying. Or, or in groups, talking with, with other people about these things. Lord, we want to be prepared for you when, you when you come. We want to do your will. We want to have Christian, stable, strong marriages and families. And we know that unless you are the center of it, we won't have, we won't have that strong foundation. We thank you so much for everything you do for us and all of the blessings you give us. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.